All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Red Light Report. Today, I'm very excited to have uh, Dr. Uma Naidu on the call. She has been described as the world's first triple threat in the food and medicine space. She's a Harvard trained psychiatrist, professional chef, graduating with her culinary school's most coveted award, and a trained nutrition specialist. Dr. Naidu founded and directs the first hospital based nutritional psychiatry service in the United States. She has also been featured in Harvard Health Publishing, the Boston Globe, Martha Stewart, the Wall Street Journal, and so much more. She has also released a national best selling book last year that's called This Is Your Brain on Food An Indispensable Guide to the Surprising Foods That Fight Depression, Anxiety, PTSD, OCD. ADHD, and more. So without further ado, Dr. Naidu, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much, Mike. It's really great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. My pleasure. And so um, I noticed that on your list of foods to alleviate uh, brain fog, you have coffee and green tea, which makes sense. So I, so I have to ask you, are you more of a coffee drinker or a matcha tea drinker? You know, it really depends on my mood. I like both. And um, I tend to have coffee in the morning. And if I need something of a little bit of a pick me up in the afternoon, I go with um, a little bit of green tea because it tends to help you focus without that buzzed feeling that coffee can give you. And that's really related to what it contains, which is the uh, EGCG and the L-theanine. So I'm split on that one. I don't think I can give up either. <laughs> that's a good answer. Some people say that uh, matcha is a cleaner form of energy compared to coffee. And if you were, let's say, to get a nice organic coffee compared to like the ceremonial grade matcha, do you think that's true that if you had to pick one or the other for like a cleaner form of nutrition and energy that matcha would be the better choice or do you think they're both fine? I think that they're both fine. And I think it really does go back to the sauce. So definitely a clean sauce is always better when it comes to food. But here's the thing, Mike, I feel that that we get into a lot of uh, discussions in the U.S. around making a choice between two potentially uh, actually positive either foods or beverages. And in, in my uh, review of the literature, coffee isn't all bad. People kind of demonize it a little bit. And some people don't drink it at all. And I think that's perfectly fine. But coffee has actually been shown to be a positive benefit in conditions in mental health, of course, within moderation. And of course, you know, paying attention to what I call body intelligence. So if you are anxious and you have a cup of coffee and it makes you feel jittery, clearly that's not for you. But a lot of people can tolerate one to two cups. Studies have shown that um, staying within 400 milligrams a day of caffeine from coffee will will actually be pretty well tolerated by a lot of people. So I rather say the sauce is always important. So of course, ceremonial grade matcha, you can't go wrong and good quality coffee. If you have a preference of taste, that's different, but coffee has a lot of good benefits. Good answer. And before we dive a little uh, deeper, especially into your book, you have a very interesting background and kind of story of how you got to be this, you know, proverbial triple threat that you are now, you know, reading your book, it's like you weren't really a cook at a young age. It kind of came on later in life for various reasons. And then you had a serious health issue that really kind of woke you up, really impacted your outlook on life and health as a whole, it seems like. So can you give us uh, the background of how you came to be the triple threat and kind of just bring us to where you are today? Sure. Um, it's a little bit of a long story, but but I know you'll stay with me on this one. So, you know, it starts off with my childhood, as do many things. And I grew up in a large South Asian family, lots of food, love and veterans. And um, I skipped out of preschool for whatever reason. I told my parents I didn't want to go and, and they let me stay home with my maternal grandmother, who actually my book is dedicated to. And that was because my mom is a double boarded physician herself. And so she was in medical school. So I was I needed a caretaker during the day. And that's really how I would say my food journey began. But it also was part of my holistic journey in terms of understanding the mind-body connection. Because my, my grandparents taught me how to meditate. They taught me yoga. But I also, you know, would pick fresh vegetables from the garden and see my grandmother prepare delicious food. So there was this ongoing conversation around science, nutrition, health. But then there were a couple of Ayurvedic practitioners in the family. So throw that in as well. And 
uh, you know, the interesting thing is, like you, like you alluded to, I didn't learn how to cook as a, as a young child. My mom taught me how to bake because I love to measure and I love science. But there were always too many cooks in the kitchen. You know, proverbially, there were aunts, grandmothers, older cousins uh, who were always busy. So I was, I was around food, but I really didn't have the need to cook. Um, so that came to me later in my life. And I discovered it to be a very positive experience in the sense that it became my creative space, my space of mindfulness. And it was something I look forward to. And I guess it was that connection to the family and especially when I moved away. But I also was was very much encouraged by my parents to to follow things that I loved to do. And I feel very blessed for that. Um, I loved medicine. I wanted to study it. There were a few physicians in my family and that made a difference too. Then I also loved good food and I loved to cook and I wanted to know more about nutrition. And uh, very early on in my career, a discussion with the patient really brought home the power of interpreting nutritional information to individuals. Because as you know, Mike, many doctors just don't learn enough nutrition in, in medical school. And that made me want to bring more of it to my daily practice. And so I included questions. I would ask people what they were doing for exercise. Knowing that psychopharmacology, the, the medications I'm prescribing, had many devastating side effects. So that was how I began to cooperate things. My trip to culinary school was really an ode to Julia Child because I couldn't afford cable TV when I was studying. But she was on public television. And when I learned that her culinary career was actually her second career, I thought, you know, I love to cook. I really want to learn more. And it was a lot of fun. And I, I learned a lot. And I was very fortunate that the different things that I was doing and studying under good mentorship and guidance um, from, from my mentors at Mass Journal has really helped me carve out the work that I was really doing, but bringing more structure to it by, by opening my clinic. Um, but as with, you know, many, many things in life, you, you're having a good time, you're working hard and things seem to be, seem to be working, working out. But, you know, that was when I faced a health crisis and I, was feeling healthy. I was probably taking on more stress than I needed to thinking back, but I found myself with a breast lump and was diagnosed in a very short time with breast cancer. And it was very, a very unnerving event in my life, not only because it was cancer, but because it was so unexpected. I really wasn't feeling unhealthy. So it's always a shout out, always get your mammogram. And what I learned from that experience was how important food is. And even though I knew it from my career and the work I was doing, I really understood it on a much deeper level because of how I ate during treatment and how my doctors would say, you know, what are you eating this week? Because I was able to tolerate fending off symptoms of anxiety without taking a medication for anxiety because this was a new experience for me. I was scared. I wasn't sure what I was facing. It was more scary because I knew the side effects of the medications I was facing. So when I realized that, I really leaned into the work I was doing, the types of food, you know, to really eat for better mental health. And I didn't expect to be my own self-experiment, but that was a very powerful thing for me to actually see that it could work. And I, I was blessed by not having as many side effects that could be adjusted that were related to diet, such as, you know, I didn't have the nausea, the vomiting, and all of those side effects. Obviously, some you can't avoid because of the nature of chemotherapy medications. But that was, I think, you know, very important to live through because I can really, in a very sincere way, share with people that it's a powerful tool. Nutrition is, and nutritional psychiatry is something that people can rely on to improve their, their mental fitness, as I like to say. That's a good story. And like you said, very impactful to, although not necessary and probably didn't want to go through it, but now that you're on the other side, very impactful. You can, right. you can pull from that history and from that personal experience when you're dealing with, with clients and other people as well. So that's pretty powerful. In the intro of your book, again, it's called, This is Your Brain on Food. You say the following, which I found pretty interesting. Until we solve nutritional problems, no amount of medication and psychotherapy is going to be able to stem the tide of mental issues in our society. So with that quote, were you saying or are you saying that really our mental health is intimately tied to nutrition? You're already saying that, but are you saying it's even more so then, well, of course, medications, prescription medications, but are you saying it's even more impactful than a counselor or a, a psychiatrist? 
for me, uh, it's not so much of, of, of the either or because the model of care that I practice is an integrated functional and holistic approach to psychiatry. So in reality, I don't want someone to choose nutrition over something else. I want them to incorporate it because I do see it as a low hanging fruit, pardon the pun, but I see it as something people are ignoring in their everyday mental health. They think about nutrition when it comes to COVID weight gain, or they think about nutrition when it comes to a family history of type 2 diabetes, but they're really not thinking about it when they see their counselor, their psychiatrist, or their therapist. What I would like them to do is use it as a very powerful tool. So if they say are doing CBT therapy or some form of talking therapy, but the doctor needs them to start off with taking a medication, why not incorporate nutrition? Because I think that if they did, they could discuss with their practitioner, um, you know, different different courses to their treatment. And I think it just provides one more tool in their toolkit. Gotcha. So like you said, it's not just one or the other. It's include this because it's being ignored more than it should to use nutrition as um, a synergistic effect with these other therapies potentially. Absolutely. And so we talked about this on our Instagram live about a month or two ago. I think it was a month ago about how the pandemic has trashed our mental health around the country, around the world, and specifically on how we eat. Because when we get stressed, we don't eat as healthy as we probably should, which again impacts our Mm -hmm. mental health. And it's kind of a vicious circle. So can you um, tell us again, and for those listening to the podcast um, that didn't watch the Instagram live, tell us for the first time, these statistics uh, related to the pandemic and how it disturbed our eating and our mental health. Absolutely. You know, we start off at the beginning of the pandemic where we found out that processed food sales were on a very, at a very high level. And part of it was because people were so panicked. And for the first time, you know, we were seeing grocery store shelves empty. And so people went for shelf stable goods. But, you know, there were many things that also uh, unfolded during the pandemic. There was a survey done by Express Scripts around spring of last year that found new prescriptions for depression, anxiety, and insomnia were rapidly in increased. And then by June, Zoloft, one of the most highly prescribed medications in the US, which is an SSRI, otherwise known as sertraline, it went on shortage, which is, you know, the years I've practiced as a psychiatrist, I've never seen Zoloft go on shortage. Then by June, the CDC released some very scary statistics. In addition to the sort of levels of depression and anxiety that were increasing, 11% of Americans thought about suicide which was a very high number and a very scary statistics. And we now also know that 20% of teens um, have considered suicide. So we know that, that it's not just certain age groups, it's, it's also the young ones who are struggling and suffering with this. What's come out you know, at the other side of the pandemic or as we go through it and be getting more data is that depression, anxiety, insomnia, trauma, substance use and abuse, as well as, you know, other forms of abuse have all risen. And I, you know, I think of the pandemic as, as one thing, but, you know, mental health and the crisis of mental health is sort of the silent pandemic. So I think the more we can try to figure our way through this, the better for people and the more options they have to feel better, the, the better we can do as well. I think the, the other scary statistics, Mike, is that they now are showing that individuals who survived COVID and who had and had COVID infections but survived have a higher propensity toward mental health conditions, in, including a recent suicide. So it's just very scary the stuff that COVID has brought forward. And I think that the more we can understand and and take out the stigma around mental health and have the conversation, and use many methods, including light therapy, you know, to, for for people to feel better, including what's at the end of our fork, which is how we're eating every day, um, become these become powerful tools. And that's why I was so excited to have you on, because even though they seem almost like complete separate entities, food and light are intimately tied. Without food, without raw, healthy, organic food, or without sunlight, I should say, you're not going to have that food. And just like you can get malnourished or have malnutrition with with a poor diet, you can be malilluminated if all you do is surround yourself with fluorescent lights, blue lit technology mm-hmm. with these screens, and that, and then you mm-hmm. rarely go outside get that healthy mm-hmm. full spectrum sunlight. And mm-hmm. so that's really where red light therapy comes from: is this deficiency in red and near infrared light that you would 
get if you were outside getting that full spectrum sunlight. Mm -hmm. And again, just like food impacts health, there is an abundance of research uh, that speaks to red and near infrared light, specifically near infrared light, because it penetrates deeper, impacting your mental health because red light Mm -hmm. therapy impacts your mitochondria, which produces energy. Thus, mitochondria are going to be most dense where you require the most energy. So your brain Mm -hmm. necessitating the most energy is very mitochondrial dense. It's great to have this conversation with food and mental health or food and just overall health because it is intimately tied to light and overall health. Like I said, when I began this uh, soliloquy, (laughs) if you're going to have that organic carrot, that organic tomato or other food, it comes from full spectrum sunlight. And if you were to put a tarp over a tree, it's going to wither away and die. So if you're going to think that you're going to optimize your health by, you know, not getting outside or not getting a healthy light, just like Mm -hmm. not giving yourself the proper nutrition, you're eventually going to become or come down with some sort of disease or cancer. And it's great to have this conversation with an expert like you in the nutrition realm. And so, you know, speaking of uh, mental health and nutrition, let's go into calming foods. In your book, you talk about, you know, Mm -hmm. the five Bs, we have fermented foods, Mm -hmm. and then those rich in magnesium. Mm -hmm. So kind of walk us through, um, especially in this time where seems like we're always stressed and anxious. These foods seem like they could be pretty darn important right now. So walk us through these calming foods and how we can implement them into our diet. Absolutely. And I just want to say that, you know, parts of the country where there's less light, people definitely have more um, depression and seasonal affective disorder is very real, um, especially in the far northeast where I live and it and in other parts of the country. So it's not something to be ignored. And I think that the more ways that we can offer people to feel better uh, become important. And food is one of them. Light is another. So, so I definitely agree with that. You know, when it comes to the stress and anxiety of the pandemic, and what has happened to people, it really does start with some very basic things. Our gut microbiome is at the center of this food mood connection. And the gut brain axis is what lends itself to us understanding that food impacts our mental health. So we have to think about how to nurture the gut microbes. And one way to nurture them is whole, whole healthy foods. So some of the pillars of nutritional psychiatry that I talk about are things like eat whole, be whole. So it's eat the orange and skip that store-bought oranges because of all the added sugars and lack of fiber. In a similar way, it's eat the rainbow of colors, those colorful plant polyphenols, antioxidants, and anti-inflammatory properties of colorful vegetables actually bring back fiber that those gut microbes thrive on. And a happy gut is a happy mood. A happy gut is a less stressed person because those microbes are being fed what they need. So those colorful salads, those colorful vegetables and fruit become important. And then that's leafy greens. So Things like um, lettuces of different colors, uh, sort of deep green shades, watercress. Think of unusual ones, you know, that will will tempt you to taste more delicious foods. Think of an interesting salad. Because folate in leafy greens is intimately tied with depression because low folate level folate levels associated with depression and sometimes loss of brain cells. So you want to be, you know, filling up on those leafy greens, which are very low, low in calorie, will help hydration and will help your mood. And then there are some very specific ones like turmeric with a pinch of black pepper has a good amount of evidence in lowering anxiety. Pepperine and black pepper activates the curcumin. So always add it in. It's just a pinch of black pepper when you're using turmeric. If you don't cook with it, use it in a tea or super smoothie. Dark chocolate is the one that uh, everyone loves to hear because extra dark chocolate, you know, 70% or darker um, is actually really great for anxiety. It's been shown to help mood, but it also helps anxiety. So it's the cacao flavonols, which are great. Dark chocolate also contains magnesium. Magnesium we know helps to lower anxiety. So it's one of the foods that people like to to include that contains magnesium. It also contains serotonin. So, you know, you really can't go wrong with a piece of dark chocolate, but that's at least a way to get started and to walk yourself back from the stress you might be feeling, the anxiety that may have developed, uh, you know, enveloped you during the uh, pandemic. I was just talking to someone the other day who said that they found they were so 
worried and anxious during the pandemic that they just almost shut down and spent much more time at home. This friend spoke about just spending more time at home with her husband. But when she really thought about it, she was shutting down and super anxious because of everything that was going on outside. So it's really, it's a very real feeling that people have had, even in individuals who we know statistics have told us have not had previous diagnoses. So I think that's just, just, it's just important to rework what we can regarding how we're eating. So like you're saying, a lot of our mood and mental health starts, or a lot of it comes from the gut. And in your book, which, which kind of blew me away, you said modern research shows that 90% of the body's serotonin is made in the digestive tract. And I wasn't aware of that. And likewise, the gut plays an important role in cortisol, which is that, you know, that stressor hormone that alone makes you pretty cognizant or or want to improve your gut health. If it plays that big of a role in serotonin, which is a mood regulator for mood and emotion. And then that also helps with that cortisol release, which again, deals with stress. So with what you just said there between the turmeric, you know, the leafy greens, which I have a question about in a bit here, Mm -hmm. all that's going to help fine tune and optimize your gut health, which um, the domino effect is going to be an improved mood and mental health, correct? Absolutely. The way that that domino effect happens is that the the gut and brain are connected. And most people don't think that because these two organs are not close by, but they are connected. They arise from the same cells in the body and they connected anatomically by the vagus nerve, uh, which is our 10th cranial nerve. Now that acts as a two-way superhighway line for those chemical messages that you're referring to. And it helps us understand that as food is digested and broken down, it is in the environment where it's going to be in contact with serotonin receptors and so many other things in that gut environment, as well as other hormones. So it sort of starts to fill in the picture and helps us understand that it's not just a one-way street, it's, it's all connected, it's bi-directional flow. And it also then helps us understand that if you're eating a healthy food, a healthy meal, the breakdown products are going to be healthier choices and healthier products that are formed by those microbes in your gut. But if you're eating those fast food french fries and a lot of sort of junk foods and processed foods, not so great, in fact, more toxic substances are broken down by the bacteria and microbes in the gut. And ultimately, that's a feedback loop. And inflammation in the gut is dysbiosis, is what eventually develops if you're eating that poor diet and you're stressed and many other things. But one of the things that impacts it is your level of what you're eating and and the the sort of the quality foods that you're eating. So if you're eating their junk food processed diet, then inflammation will set up over time and inflammation in the gut leads to inflammation in the brain. That's that's how the, the loop happens. And what you find is individuals who change their diet and who, for whatever reason, are just not eating a healthy diet anymore, have an uptick of symptoms, mood, anxiety, and other things. Uh, So you you see it clinically as well. Interesting. So so what you eat impacts your mental health via the vagus nerve and vice versa, because like you said, it's a two-way highway. So your mental health can have an effect on your gut as well. Absolutely. So the vagus nerve, you think think about it as a sort of transportation system. Think about it as a superhighway. And what that is doing is allowing for that bidirectional chemical messaging to occur. But the chemical messages arise from the breakdown. One of the ways they arise is from the breakdown of the food products. And, you know, when you understand that so much of the serotonin is in the gut, you realize that someone, when someone is prescribed a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor like Prozac or Zoloft and many others, the first um, side effects they have are actually usually gastrointestinal and uh, they usually subside, but that's the reason. So it helps to fill in the, the jigsaw piece puzzles. Definitely. And so what about leaky gut? Of course, health and stress impacts that, but is that more directed towards systemic inflammation and autoimmune diseases versus mental health? It's actually related to both because the gut lining is a single cell layer then. When you look at it, you know, under a microscope. So, so the, these single cells, uh, single cell layers are held together by what we call tight junctions. And when more toxic substances are produced by the gut microbes, uh, one way that they produce, like I said, is just kind of a bad diet, a not less healthy diet. They, they start to really puncture holes or create, create leakiness in that lining. 
And leaky gut can be related to many, many different health conditions, but one of the things is how you're eating. And that is what explains that connection with mental health. Gotcha. Understood. Since we're talking about the gut brain health, there's two pieces of uh, research I want to kind of review here related to photobiomodulation on impacting gut health. So the first one is um, a 2018 article out of the journal Photobiomodulation, Photomedicine, and Laser Surgery, and it's called Photobiomics Can Light, Including Photobiomodulation, Alter the Microbiome. And the results from this study were that the work by this research group demonstrated that photobiomodulation using both red and near-infrared light delivered to the abdomen in mice can alter the gut microbiome in a potentially beneficial way. Um, this has also now been demonstrated in human subjects. The, the conclusion is that the photobiomodulation can alter the microbiome, meaning upregulate the healthy bacteria, downregulate the bad, um, and also, of course, normalize circadian rhythm and other things. So pretty interesting. That research was done on um, mice specifically, but they also alluded to some human right. studies as well. So mm -hmm. that was pretty that's exciting. Awesome. Yeah. I, and then, I think uh, that's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And so again, they, they were speaking to photobiomodulation right in near infrared light, mm -hmm. but also mm -hmm. sun exposure, mm -hmm. as long as you don't, you know, get skin damage, exposing your belly, because right. almost half of the light that hits earth is infrared. So if you're getting good exposure mm -hmm. to the sun, you could be altering your gut microbiome uh, for the better. Mm -hmm. That's not what this re research is saying, but that's a likely potential. And so the second article, which is even more exciting, I think, was actually from this year, March 2021, out of the Journal of mm -hmm. Photochemistry and Photobiology. It's called Gut Flora Targeted Photobiomodulation Therapy Improves Senile Dementia mm -hmm. in Beta Amyloid Induced Alzheimer's Disease Animal Model. And so in this study, photobiomodulation was performed on the abdomen of the mice using red and near infrared for eight weeks. And okay. specifically, the red light therapy treatment reversed the typical increase in the helicobacter and uncultured bacteroidales. I don't know. I probably butchered that. So the conclusion of the, the study was that our data indicates that gut flora targeted photobiomodulation regulates the diversity of intestinal flora, which may improve damage caused by Alzheimer's disease. So this research is pretty, pretty darn awesome because Alzheimer's is becoming more and more rampant. And the research is showing that using red and near infrared light specifically directed towards the gut may impact the intestinal flora, but also the, the beta amyloid plaque that is a huge part of Alzheimer's disease. So pretty cool research, those two articles. Kind of curious to get your thoughts on that coming from your nutritional psychiatric perspective. Absolutely. You know, I think it's firstly, any modulation of the microbiome in a positive way is a good one for mental health. Increasing the diversity of flora in those gut microbes is, is really important because even, you know, talking about how we do that through food and eating a variety of vegetables and fruit and beans, nuts, seeds, fiber-rich foods becomes important. So I'd love to see what comes out of that research in future studies. Uh, it's certainly very promising. Doctors who went to medical school a couple of decades ago weren't learning about the microbiome. So it really is cutting edge research and it's something we want to hear more about and read more about. So I, I will certainly be looking for that. Definitely. And, and preferably some more or, or some human clinical trials. Exactly. I mean, it's exciting that they're on mice, but yeah, let's move forward with some human clinical trials. And again, it's not myopic, meaning red light therapy or photobiomodulation is going to be the end all be all. It's just another tool. It's another piece of the puzzle. But you mm -hmm. complement that with a nutritional diet, proper mental health, exercise, mm -hmm. decreased stress, you know, all those things. It's just another part of the puzzle to, yeah. you know, optimize health. And, you know, the other thing about um, spending time outdoors, right, is that 10, 10 minutes, because you mentioned sun exposure. And so 10 minutes of outdoor time actually builds up 80% of our vitamin D levels and low vitamin D is linked to depression and anxiety. So that's an easy way to go. And then, you know, be concerned about your sunblock and making sure that you have some protection, um, but that's really all you need. And then there are other forms of getting light, which are important as well, like you've spoken about. Gotcha. Exactly. And I want to circle back for a moment about the leafy greens, because in some circles, especially like biohacking with uh, Dave Asprey, they're kind of on this hell-bent mission 
for people to stop eating raw kale specifically, like you already talked about previously, kind of the six pillars of nutritional uh, psychiatry. I think it was your third one, uh, the greener, the better. And you have this list mm-hmm. of uh, greens that include leafy greens, such as spinach, Swiss chard, collard greens, arugula, romaine, and dandelion greens. And so I don't know if it's coincidence or not, but you didn't include kale. Um, so is mm-hmm. it a coincidence or do you have an issue with raw kale and uh, like Dave Asprey and, and that whole community, their issue is that raw kale is a goitrogenic food that disrupts thyroid function, or you can get these mm-hmm. oxalic acid crystals that can build up in your muscle, which mm-hmm. gives you muscle pain, mm-hmm. similar to uric acid mm-hmm. crystals, giving you gout. So do you see an mm-hmm. issue with raw kale or not? So, you know, I think it's about how the microbiome responds. The, for example, steaming likely steaming kale can actually help to reduce the oxalate levels. So that's one solution um, to try. Uh, I like making roasted kale chips because it's a nice, healthy crunch to uh, people who like, you know, say pretzels. Now, you know, I think it, it really comes back to that gut microbiome. Some people will respond in one way while others will not because the gut microbiome is like a thumbprint. So I don't think we can say that it's it's universal. Um, I believe that there are concerns about raw kale. But, you know, I think rather than get into a sort of polarization of the food, it is otherwise a healthy food to eat. And if you run into concerns or you, if you have that in your medical history, then you should be concerned. Or if you run into problems with, uh, you know, with your thyroid or, or, or stones, absolutely have it checked. It could, I'm not saying it wouldn't be an offending agent in that instance. But in general, I like people to approach food from a more a broad-based approach and only eliminate it if they run into problems. That doesn't mean that people haven't found some correlation or concern with it. I think in this country, people tend to get a little polarized sometimes. So I would say include it unless you have health issues with it. And of course, always speak to your doctor. Speaking of polarization, of course, like the last several years, we've had the keto diet, uh, we've had paleo, we've had the carnivore. What are your thoughts on that? I know you're thinking more global and eating just a healthy, uh, colorful diet, but do you think there's any credence to these quote unquote fad diets or sensationalized diets? Um, and then also, we, we talked about this on the Instagram live, but what are your thoughts? And do you integrate fasting or the fast mimicking diet or uh, intermittent fasting? Absolutely. So, you know, I, I, like I said, when I think we last spoke, I, I remain diet agnostic because anyone who comes to me is coming to me for their mental health issues. So whether they're eating a vegan or a carnivore diet, my role is to help them tweak that to a better place for their mental health. So I tend to stay out of the diet wars of, you know, I can only eat one food, but if someone is excluding healthy foods, I will let them know. And it really depends on their individual um, situation because I, I, I've really become much more personalized about the nutritional psychiatry plans now. That being said, people do get confused about what to include and what to exclude. And that's where I go to the symptoms that they're experiencing in mental health and foods that may actually set off certain symptoms um, as well. And so, you know, I think I think that's easier for people to tolerate if they're following a certain diet and it's working for them and they're branded by their doctor, absolutely go for it. With intermittent fasting, there's a really good body of literature around the uh, physical health benefits. And we really are learning more now about the mental health benefits. Anecdotally, patients will talk about lifting of brain fog, having more energy. I think there's a role for mindful eating in association with intermittent fasting. There's also some good research around how it helps with your relationship to cravings. So I think there's a place for it in nutritional psychiatry. And I think the the evidence is emerging based on the research. So um, I'm happy to incorporate it uh, with individuals, but I want people to be careful about just not doing it on their own uh, without speaking to the doctor. Because one of the biggest concerns is becoming hypoglycemic. Um, Doesn't always happen, but if you don't know that you have a health condition underlying, and you are fasting and don't realize that you could come ill. Gotcha. Um, can you kind of uh, quickly expound on mindful eating for those that um, aren't familiar with that? Sure. 
Sure. You know, I think um, I think doctors are notorious for eating on the run, eating while standing, eating while on call, um, that type of stuff. And many health professionals are as well because of the busy lifestyle when you're in a hospital. And I think it's the opposite of that. It's it's really taking pause to be mindful about what you're eating, appreciating that the sensation, the taste, the flavor, the appearance of your food, you know, chewing the actual food, not just gobbling it down, sitting down, having a, a designated space in your home where you are eating your meal. It's, it includes all of that include, as well as the actual experience of the food. And it's been associated with better digestion, improved satiety after eating. And I think that any of us who's, you know, been one of those busy clinicians and eating on the go knows that when you gobble down a meal, you just, it's like you need, you need another meal because you, it's almost as though you've eaten it so fast, your body doesn't absorb it. It's just a great thing to start to incorporate in your day. So like you're saying, instead of like you're saying, just being on the go, go, go or watching it or eating while you're like watching a show. So you're being totally separated from your food, having that gratitude, having that appreciation for the food. And they've shown this in with water. If even if you just mm-hmm. write the word love on your bottle or love on your glass that you're drinking from and you see that mm-hmm. and you have that in your mind, you literally change the structure at the cellular level of the water versus being stressed mm-hmm. or being mad or or anxious mm-hmm. or whatever. So your thoughts, mm-hmm. you know, clearly have an impact. Absolutely like saying, influence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. On digestion. Cause if you're more appreciative, if you're more in the moment with your food, the digest, you're not going to be as mm-hmm. stressed. Your cortisol levels are down. Your body's going to have more yes. energy to digest and all that stuff. Like you already said. So yeah, that's a great point about just being mindful and present whenever you're eating mm-hmm. or consuming you're food. Eating. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. And so before we sign off, we're running a little short on time here. I would love for you to speak on this last chapter in your book about, you know, libido and how oxytocin, uh, fenugreek and, and these aphrodisiacs can, can boost that. Cause just like stress mm-hmm. and co- high cortisol levels and systemic inflammation can ru- ruin everything. Well, it can sure affect your libido. So how can nutrition kind of counteract that? Absolutely. You know, one of the, one of the things that uh, becomes important is people don't often associate again how they're eating with how their libido may be affected. And, you know, just like we are all, we have one body and it all intra- all the organs interact, that's, that's where food does, does connect things. And what I wanted people to understand was that there were, you know, oxytocin is sort of the, um, the hormone that is the hugging hormone. It's, you know, it's what brings people together and it has so many good effects. So it turns out that food can be effective here. Now, fenugreek is not a well-known spice. It's, it's often an Asian spice used in uh, Indian cooking. It can be a little bitter. But there are other foods like pistachios and avocados that, you know, had some really good evidence behind them in terms of incorporating those into your, um, your daily diet if you're having a little bit of difficulty with libido because it could, in fact, help. Remembering that nothing helps overnight. It's not, you know, eating pistachios and having an immediate effect, but it's it's incorporating these foods in uh, a portion controlled way. Never overdo even a good thing, you know, not so super healthy, but when you go beyond a certain amount, they become calorie dense and not as healthy. So including those, I felt was useful to people because sometimes individuals with mental health issues also struggle a little bit with their libido. It could be the side effect of medications, but it also could be just that they feeling depressed and they're losing that, um, that sense of uh, having a libido. So I felt it was important to round off dealing with, with emotional health and what I like to call mental fitness. So is there something specific with the, like the fenugreek, avocados, pistachios? Is there something nutritionally or uh, metabolically going on that helps specifically libido? Is it the fats? Is it you the- know, certain uh, vitamins or minerals? Right. So, so I think that, you know, it's, it's usually the mechanism with which each of those interacts with oxytocin. And what I do in the book is kind of walk you through those mechanisms so you get a better sense of it and why you should include the foods. And then the recipes are associated with how to include the foods as well. Gotcha. Perfect. Last question. What are some things people can do today? And I'm sure we can kind of guess what those could be, or we've already learned a lot from you. But what are some things people could implement today to start optimizing their health and their their nutrition? Absolutely. I like like people to just kind of have that mindful moment with themselves and think about something, maybe a habit or two that they've picked up during the pandemic that they're not liking. 
uh, especially related to food. Maybe they've leaned into an extra glass of wine. Maybe they have started eating more processed foods because they felt they wanted to get things in their cupboards or their kitchen cupboards that you know were more shelf stable. Whatever it is that you that you've kind of picked up is that not so great habit. I want you to stop there. Because if you can identify it, that means you're aware of it. And if you're aware of it, that means you have the potential to change it. You know, mind is a very powerful thing. If it's one of those habits, think about what you want to do right now today based on what you've heard that you can do to change it. Can you eat more satiating meals by filling more vegetables, having, having a plant-rich diet, having more of those veggies which are low-calorie and will be filling, bring fiber to those gut microbes, help with the balance in your gut, is that one thing you could do? So I'd like you to start there. And then I'd like you to realize that it doesn't happen overnight. You've got to stick with the with, with the change if you make. So make more, make a, make a change and stick with it. Then, then add on another change to that. Um, and you will find that you will feel emotionally better because those types of changes, while they may seem super simple, actually do benefit your mental health. And I think that's the connection that we're sort of missing around food. Yeah, I appreciate that answer. That makes sense. Like you're saying, not trying to do everything at once. Implement at once. something, yeah. be consistent, make it attainable so you don't get burned out or, or you lose compliance. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. just continue to add more and more slowly over time. It's not, a, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. So yeah, that's a great answer. Exactly. It is a marathon. All right, Dr. Naidu, where can people go to learn more about you and what you're doing? Absolutely. Um, please follow me on social. That's where I put out all the current research and give people updates about what I'm up to, which is at D-R-U-M-A-N-A-I-D-O-O, -O, which is at Dr. Uma Naidu. And subscribe to my website where you'll get my newsletter, blogs that I write, and also get an update of what I'm up to. That's umanaidumd.com. And I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Dr. Naidu, appreciate you having, having you on this podcast. Again, guys, the book is called This Is Your Brain on Food. We barely scratched the surface of what's in the book and um, I'm sure the expertise of Dr. Naidu. But again, appreciate your time. We should have you on sometime uh, in the future. Hopefully you release another book with more great information. Thanks so much, Mike. I would love that. All right. Have a great day. And everyone have a fantastic week and weekend wherever you are.